Okay, I think there's a few more people coming in, perhaps. This is the newest building of the Adventist Histor or the historic Adventist Village. Um, this is not an original. It is a replicated building um, depicting uh, what the publishing house looked like uh, when it was moved here. So the publishing work, how does that begin? Does anybody, yes? Is this the original location? Of the, of the I don't think so. House? I'm quite certain it's not. Um, but uh, yes, it's so. But nevertheless, it's it's the same size. We know the dimensions and the same. We have drawings, and so it looks, at least from the outside, as it looked um, back then. Exactly how they laid it out um, inside, we don't know. And so, anyhow, but how does the publishing work begin in the church? Does anybody know how that begins? And Ellen White asked her husband to start writing the track. Yes, that's right. But why does she do that? Just because she had this idea? It's a vision. She God. saw lights. Yes, streams of light. That's right. In the year 1848, Ellen has a vision where she sees James White. She, he's instructed to publish a paper, and it will be as streams of light going around the entire world. Mm -hmm. And that right there is the inspiration for James and others to start printing the first paper. What was it called? Do you remember the name of the first paper? It came out in 1849. Present truth, Present truth is correct. And that's right. The Present Truth was a was uh, one was one paper, and then they started publishing another one called the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, <clears throat> and that one is going to continue on to this very day, although it's been renamed several times and is now known as the Adventist Review, and that paper is launched in 1850, and that starts in New England, okay, and in, in Maine, later in Connecticut, and then moving through different parts of upstate New York, James and Ellen White are publishing the paper, but guess what? James and Ellen are writing the stuff for the paper, writing material for the paper, and they're living in other people's homes. They don't have a press. And so they're having to send it to somebody else to do the printing for them. And those other people, did they keep the Sabbath? No. No, they did not. And so they're doing the work for Adventists on the Sabbath, which bothered the whites. They had to put up with it for a while, as long as time lasted, until they could finally afford to buy their own press. And in 1852, they moved to Rochester, New York, and they got a home there that they're renting, and they got a press. But they put the press in the house. And guess what? They also have all the other people that are working there in their house in Rochester. At one point, there was as many as 20 people, including children, living in that home. And they had Sabbath worship services in that house every week. Mm. Can you imagine all the cacophony yes. and the chaos yes. and the noise? Oh, it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word, that's how it began. And kids get into it. And kids getting into it. And that's how it worked. But let me tell you, why did you need 20 people? It's because it took a lot of people to do the work. What you see here is a Washington hand press. It is not the one that Adventists used because sadly that one burned in the fire of the Review Herald in the 1901 or 2 or 3, whatever it was. And But this is one that's just like it. And so what you would do is you would take a form like this and you would have to go through and you would have to set every letter of every word by hand. That would take just a minute or two. Right? <laughs> They got fast, really. So they could do it really quick, but you have to do this, and you would set this whole thing, and this would be one sheet. Actually, one sheet had four. This one is probably, well, the way the Adventists did it, they had, they had one sheet here. This is not the size. This bed isn't big enough is for, that, for it to be four. Is this one? Uh, yes, it's, it would look like this. Yeah. It would look like this when it's all set and tied and so forth. And you can see it there. And that's going to be the front page, right? <laughs> and then after you get the, the type set, okay? And so you have, you literally have, that's one job, the type setter, okay? <laughs> so start counting them. After the type setter has set the type, then you have somebody do what? You've got to get ink on the type, don't you? <laughs> so you have a roller boy or somebody who has little splotches, like little rubber things that yeah. you could do it, or you could roll it. So you've got to put ink on, this, on, the, on the, uh, the type. Then you have another person who puts a sheet of paper here. They fold this down on top. It slides underneath here. You pull the handle, and this will press it down to where the ink adheres to the paper. Now you're done, right? No. No, why? 
You got to do it over and over. Because you got to do several pages, right? You got to do eight pages, but that, that, that's not all. After you, what happens with the paper now that you're done? You the ink's dry, dry right? <laughs> yeah. no, you got to let it dry. So guess what you're going to see? This room is nice and clear and clean. You can walk, no problems. No, 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 no. In a printing house, particularly in the 19th century, you've got lines going all every which way, and you're hanging paper everywhere so that the ink can dry. And you have to keep it in some kind of order so that you can put it back together, right? And then you can eventually uh, send it out. Now, once you have it dried and you put it together, then you've got to fold it and you've got to send it through the mail. So you have several different types of jobs here that, that are going to be going on. And so it takes 20 people to do that. And some of the people that are working in this house that are living with the whites in Rochester, they're including a cook. Because if everyone's working on writing and publishing, you've got to have a cook. Then you have someone to take care of the children. Okay, so you've got people like that, and so it takes it takes a daycare. It, take, it took a, a small little army, and so that's how it started. And can you imagine how difficult that would have been? Would you have enjoyed that kind of life? <laughs> Think about someone getting sick. What happens? You live in such close quarters. Everyone. Everyone gets sick, and guess what? That is the tragedy. And in Rochester, I think there's at least three Adventist pioneers who died. It was sad. There were joys, though, too, because also some people got married. Uriah and Harriet Smith. Uriah Smith will become the editor of the Review and Herald in 1855. He met his wife, and they got married while they were living in the White's home. And so that was in 1857. Um, and so actually, no, I guess it wouldn't have been, forgive me, they didn't get married while they were there because they, it was 1857. They would have been after they got the boundary, but they met there. They met there, and so the romance was born there. That's the point. <laughs> so there was high times, there were low times. It was difficult, but you can understand why Battle Creek would be attractive, right? Mm -hmm. You have the opportunity to have your own building. Yes. Oh. Have mercy. So you can understand why it wasn't a, a hard sell to get the whites to come here. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so this building, one that looks just like this, would have been used for that purpose. You can see other rooms here. If you look around the corner here, this is depicting the editor's room where the editor would go through and not only write their editorial, but they would have to go through and check every page to look for typos. Okay? <clears throat> so they would be doing that work. Now, one other fun fact that I can point out to you when it comes to printing history. Now, when you have big letters and small letters, what do you call those big letters and small letters? Capitol. Capitol. You call them capital letters, yes, if they're big. What are some other words you can call them? For the big letters, you can also call them uppercase and lowercase. Okay. Where do we get the words and names uppercase and lowercase? Right here. In a print shop, the big letters were always literally housed in the uppercases. And the smaller letters were literally housed in the lowercases. I don't know why they did it that way. That seems backwards to me because you needed a lot more lowercase letters and uppercase. You know, it's been over a lot more. But that's how they did it, folks. And that's how we get the name today. Okay. Any questions before we move on? We missed that. We missed what you said about that. The uppercase. Yeah, the, the uppercase, the, the capital letters are literally kept in the uppercases. And that's where we get the phrase uppercase, oh. and the smaller letters are held in the lower cases, and they're literally called lowercase letters for that reason. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't Adventist only, that was print, printing general. Mm -hmm. So business is the most important product after that. Yes, business started to boom after they got their own space here in Battle Creek, and the papers started to take off, and then shortly thereafter, they're adding more papers. They did add the, the youth instructor while they were still in Rochester in 1852. But after this, you get the health reformer, and then you get many, many, many more and more that are going to start launching from Battle Creek. Whenever you had the space to do the work, it made it a lot easier. Yes, it could help. It could help because you can't have a